So thank you. Thank you. Um, so these afternoon talks are much more interesting to me. This is where I spend most of my time with our, um, and I think you are babies with BPD. Um, as I mentioned prior, we have a BPD collaborative and we spend a lot of time debating all the things that we're thinking, um, looking at the literature, looking at our own experiences. Um, so with this talk, I just wanna to bring to you some of our experiences and how we manage within our unit, which in some cases are different for others. Um, because there isn't a whole lot of literature out there. We'll take a look at some of the things that are there. There just isn't a whole lot. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Brian had already really talked about BPD and the, the old BPD and the new BPD and how we really define those. Um, and chronic lung disease. We talk about BPD and then we talk about chronic lung disease and what is that. And, and to us and for going forward, I mean, at us at CHOP and then for me going forward, um, with this talk, just so that we're on the same page. Our new BPD is, you know, pretty much after our surfactant use. Um, chronic lung disease is kind of like that middle time frame when we don't quite meet the age requirements yet to get that BPD diagnosis, but um, we're, we know we're not normal and there's something going on with our lungs. So we kind of use chronic lung disease in the literature and when talking, this overall encompassing, but it's not really a a, a true diagnosis that has a good definition. It's more of an umbrella term. And um, how we discuss um, BPD is, you know, it's predominantly characterized by our impaired growth in, in airway inflammation. And we have found that there's a whole lot of airway disease as well as lung disease when we're looking at BPD in these chronic lung disease kids and really taking a deeper dive into what's the pathology and what's going on with each individual kid to really know how we're gonna define them. There was a consensus definition from the, um, it's the National Institute of um, it's Children's Health and Related Diseases and the National um, National Institutes of Health, I missed the letter there, it should be NIH, <laughs> um, uh, for the lung blood. And uh, this is our main definition. There was a big consensus that came together within the US, and I believe it was international actually, to say what is BPD and what are the definitions and what are the cases, and hopefully going forward with all of these studies, as Brian had mentioned, everybody used a different definition of BPD and you had to really look at each study to see what they used as their definition. And oftentimes, you couldn't compare the two studies together at all because they used very different definitions as to what BPD was. So everybody now hoping, hopefully will follow these categories and definitions, so then we're able to start compare things. There's really two different diagnostic categories and two groups those that were born less than 32 weeks of age, those that were born uh, greater than or equal to 32 weeks of age. And then if you were born less than 32 weeks of age, looking at them at 36 weeks post-menstrual age, and that's when you can really get your diagnosis of BPD. Um, for those that were born greater than 32 weeks, um, looking at greater than 28 days on oxygen or less than 56 days postnatal age, homeward discharge. So there's certain time frames in their age where you go to make that definition, and before those time frames is really when you fall into that chronic lung disease population. We know you're not normal, but, we, but you don't quite meet the criteria to become BPD yet. And these are the definitions between mild, moderate, and severe, because we know there are definitely variations in BPD and how, what the severity is. So this consensus group pulled together different definitions, and again, looking at whether you were less than 32 weeks or greater than or equal to 30, 32 weeks um, gestation. And then pretty much, even at any time frame, if you need greater than or equal to 30% oxygen, and that's even with a nasal cannula, or if you require positive pressure ventilation, it doesn't really matter when you were born, you're in the severe category. Um, so that's one of the things, that the main population that I work with is in the severe BPD group. Um, some of them is within a moderate, but predominantly they're in the severe group and that's kind of what we're gonna talk about going forward. I think it's, it's very important to remember, um, with BPD, instead of it being one very specific definition, the diagnosis with a specific definition, it's more of a syndrome, because all of these kids 
look and react very differently, although they all have the same definition of BPD. You can't treat them all in a cookie, cookie cutter fashion. You have to treat them according to what their needs are and what their symptoms are. So BPD really involves the entire lung. It involves the parenchyma. It has lung vascular injury, um, specifically with pulmonary hypertension or some, some veno-occlusive diseases where the heart really plays a big role. Um, or the damage to the heart plays a big role in what's going on damaging the lungs. Small and large airway disease with malacia, stenosis, and hyperreactivity. Although the hyperreactivity really hasn't been well studied or defined or we even know if it, if it works or if it happens in this population, but there's a theory there. And then it's the same disease again with very many underlying pathologies and we really have to take a look at them. So this is just a, a, a little splattering of these are three very different babies. Three different CAT scans or, or CT scans, they all have the diagnosis of severe BPD and they all have severe parenchymal disease. But I think if we all take a look at them, we can agree that it's very different lung injury there and you would treat them all very differently. Your ventilation strategy would be different and, and the side effects that they have of, of their other systems are going to be very different according to what's going on in their lungs there. So I'm going to um, provide a couple cases throughout this talk to see how, how it highlight the fact that they're all very different, even though they all have severe, severe BPD. Our first case is a two-month-old um, that came to us at two months of age to our unit. Um, the NICU that I work in, um, we're a, a children's hospital. We don't have a delivery unit, so we don't get the premature babies. They come to us after they're several months old and they're having problems with them. So we, don't, um, that, we never take care of anybody from birth unless they have a problem and they're going through fetal surgeries or, or like that. We only deliver about 200 babies a year in our unit, it's very small. Um, so it came to us at two years of, two months of age, X27 weekers, birth weight was, was 1060, has not been off the ventilator for his entire life, has had high frequency ventilation, um, both oscillator and jet, and conventional mechanical ventilation, um, had PA lighting, and several courses of steroids before even being brought to us. Over the next three months, we trialed many different types of ventilatory strategies, another dose of steroids, so three total over the time frame. Um, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on, so we got a lung biopsy. And you can see here um, the main difference. This here on the left, you can't see that. Um, the one on your left here, this is a normal um, lung biopsy. And you can see the different alveolar um, patches, and some of them, some of the pockets are bigger than others. This was a lung biopsy from this infant. You can see the very, um, very wide alveolar sacs um, and very, very um, simplification of the alveolar spaces. And this is one of the reasons why we were having such a big problem with this baby. Um, this is um, then another child. Um, the x-ray was very easy overall, um, very small cystic changes. You couldn't really see uh, much other than these hazy cystic changes. Um, and this is how the lung looked on autopsy. And then you can, and through a microscope, these big sacs and these very big, this is one, one alveolar space and how huge it is. And it's just very hard when, when the lungs and the alveoli aren't as developed, and so they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not, they're not um, helping with oxygen delivery or clearance of CO2. <coughs> One of our next cases uh, was an infant with a very heterogeneous lung disease. Um, this is a five-month-old um, when presented to our hospital. It was an X25 weaker, birth weight was 620 grams. Um, was only on CPAP times one day. Um, this unit um, elects, uh, treats their infants with CPAP primarily, and then when they get RDS, intubates and gives surfactant. So after one day, it was intubated and given surfactant times two doses. Um, and then extubated after the second dose, um, was reintubated again on day of like eight until two months of age. Um, and they were transferred to us for an inability to wean down from CPAP. They have had to continue to keep um, reintubating this baby. Um, and you can see with this CAT scan, um, there's this huge, large dilated area um, on the bottom right hand side there. Um, so this lung injury is very different. Um, you see some cystic changes, you see some atelectatic areas, and that right upper lobe there, and this very large dilated area um, in the left lower lobe there. 
A third case um, is a 25 weeker who was five months old when they were transferred to us and they were transferred for a second opinion of withdrawal of care. Um, but the family before making that decision really wanted to have a second consultation. Um, and been on mechanical ventilation her whole life. She came to us on a PEEP of three, and they were using a very low level of PEEP because of the overinflation that you can see on their x-ray. Um, in this area down here, there's extra areas of, you almost see lung down here. It's because the, the lung was herniating over the diaphragm. That's how hyperinflated they were. Um, and I don't have a full CAT scan to really show you, and the one up there is very, it's very poor, but you can see how large that lung on the right is herniating over um, and how severe the hyperinflation is. Um, we perform on all of our infants as long as they're intubated um, dynamic chest CTs. We get both an inflation and exhalation film so we can really take a look at how the lungs are um, managed at the different levels. And our exhalation film is on zero repeat so we can really see what happens um, with the airways as well so we can get a good assessment of the lungs as well as the airways during that CT. Um, and in between, you can see on the, on the CT there, um, the, the slice that I gave you, is that the lung disease really isn't all that abnormal. But you see this big hyperinflation and herniation over. Um, for this infant, we um, ended up, after this CT scan, um, this is another piece of it. This is our inflation, exflation. And the arrow here on the right, I apologize, the pointer's gone. This is the trachea, right here. So your top is the inspiratory film, your bottom is the expiratory film, and when we got rid of all of the peep, um, you could see, one, how dilated this trachea is on this side. This is a very wide margin. And on exhalation, your trachea almost goes away completely. So this was an infant who had very severe lung disease. We ended up on 13 of peep to help try and manage what was going on. And then you can also see this right upper lobe, which is very flat, and almost the whole time, and we're really unable. We helped with the hyperinflation by adding the peep on, but this this right upper lobe was still a problem. So for this particular infant, we actually ended up whoops, working with our our colleagues in pulmonary, um, and they ended up doing some stents in this right upper lobe because it was it was very um, stenotic, and they actually did three different dilations with stents and were able to help open that up. And this baby um, who came to us for a second opinion on withdrawal of care actually went home on no oxygen at all. Once we were able to, we determined it was lung disease, or airway disease, not lung disease, that was causing the problems in this infant. And by um, being able to take care of that right upper lobe, um, she actually got a trachea, a, a tracheostomy to help with the, with the malacia on her trach, but no oxygen, no ventilator, just a tracheostomy that really helped. Um, and then. Uh, the last we saw, she they came down to visit at our 18-month appointment with pulmonary, and they were doing um, plugging trials of her trait, getting ready for decannulation. So, it's a very, um, very good case. These next two cases, I'm going to show you in parallel, and you can see how, how just to show the difference in the underlying pathology can be, even though the babies start off at very similar places, and they have that same diagnosis of severe BPD. So both were at a gestational age of, of 23 weeks, 500, 600 grams. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, they were both um, intubation for 64 days and 61 days. Their age of transfer over to us was both around 100 days, 160 days. Both got steroids. Um, this one had more courses than the other. Um, this one also did not have any evidence of pulmonary hypertension on echo, and this one did. Those are kind of our main um, differences between the two. Both came on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation with full support of, of similar rates, similar PIPs, um, and similar PEEP levels, and, 20 and under 30% oxygen. But when you looked at them, their breathing pattern on the respiratory assessment was very severe work of breathing. They were on full non-invasive support, but their breathing pattern just looked ugly. And they were kept on non-invasive support because we don't want to intubate, because that's the bad thing. Um, and, and that's kind of, as we talked earlier, the pendulum has kind of swung, swung to the other side where we were trying to avoid mechanical ventilation at all costs and intubating, but this was the cost. Um, we don't know if this is the cause that happened with these babies, but their work of breathing was so bad on physical support. Surprisingly, they didn't have any 
um, skin breakdown injuries, but um, they, they did have really, really severe work of breathing, um, but only one of them had, had pulmonary hypertension. So this is um, now taking these infants individually. Um, here is the admission chest x-ray, and you can see here that we have these little round densities on both sides. Um, which this one on this side could be could look like some more centralized atelectasis, but you still have some kind of defining borders around them, which were very suspicious to us. Um, so we did a CT um, and confirmed those round lesions um, were abscesses and sent the baby down for needle, needle biopsy. Um, and um, that had MSSA in it. So we treated that abscesses. Um, they actually only drained this one. They left this one alone. Um, and then we treated. And this is, our round densities are gone, but we still have severe lung disease. But that was that superimposed infection where that infectious process really causes um, a huge problem. But bilaterally, you can see it starting to resolve a little bit. But after the infections were completely gone, this baby went home with no respiratory support. Um, this next case, you can see, again, round densities. This is a CT scan. You can't really see these, see it that well on this chest x-ray because the, the lung injury is actually quite great um, around it. So really only going into the, into the CAT scan can you really see the, the changes there. Um, and then the other thing to look at too is how wide this trachea is. Um, which is a challenge. And this is what we drained out. It's pretty nasty looking stuff there. Um, so our, this infant here um, on echo had, had a um, super systemic RV pressure, had moderate RV dilation. Um, this was our kid that had a, a pulmonary hypertension. So we knew that, we saw it on echo. And this is what the chest x-ray looked like and what our CAT scan looked like. Um, and once we actually intubated the baby, started ventilating them, this pulmonary hypertension kind of melted away and it tended to not be a problem anymore. We got a follow-up echo and it wasn't there. Um, so interestingly enough, one of our um, cardiologists who is a specialist in pulmonary hypertension and we call them down because in order for us to do anything other than inhale nitric oxide, um, so it's a denophil or goes in 10 or anything we need to in our hospital have a group of cardiology. And he always comes down and he spends a lot of time and he looks at us and goes, you need to ventilate the lungs better. And we're like, we've been doing that. And we've been pounding our heads against the wall trying to ventilate the lungs better. But this pulmonary hypertension is killing us. So before he even comes down, we make, we're, we make sure that we're optimizing the best that we possibly can. So after intubating this little one and, and, our, and our pulmonary hypertension went away, um, Interestingly, we were able to wean down to 21% very low support very quickly, just as this other facility had done many times. Um, but it made us really think, if this is severe BPD and this is parenchymal disease, we really should be able to wean down that quickly and get to minimum ventilator support that quickly with no oxygen. But the way that the, this x-ray looks, it's pretty bad. So we talked with pulmonary and we got a bronch, uh, bedside bronchoscopy on this patient, and here is on inspiration um, and expiration, our bronchoscopy pictures. And you can see in some areas we're very wide open, you go farther down and, our, and the bronchus is completely collapsing. So we know we have a significant amount of malacia. Um, so this, this little one has really bad airway disease with malacia, but not necessarily lung disease. And we ventilate the lung, the pulmonary hypertension away, taking off all of that relief on the heart. So um, she ended up being tricked and being on um, CPAP and pressure support with a, a 12 of PEEP in order to help maintain the 21% oxygen. So she needed that really high level of PEEP in order to really maintain. So there's a lot of challenges that we have um, in management with BPD. Um, we have combined pathologies with very severe lung injury and this arrestive development that we had, we had talked about. Um, and it presents to us in very different ways, even with the exact same infants, um, the exact same baseline as to how they were born, they still end up with getting this very different lung disease, some going home on full support, some getting tricked, some going home on absolutely nothing. 
Um, and it's, it, it makes us really look at each individual case to tell us exactly what it is um, that we need to be doing to treat them. There's really no definitive treatment, unfortunately, for the prevention of PPD, with, which Brian had already started discussing. Um, and most of the current clinical practices are really inadequately studied um, and is still um, pretty much, you could say, in the unsafe realm. You couldn't widely implement it over anyone because it hasn't been studied for its side effects um, or really know that it's going to work outside of that end of one, that one child that it really worked on. Um, and there's really large practice variations that we found amongst the, the PPD centers and the collaborative in the U.S. We all treat our babies very differently for some of the same diseases. So that goes to show us that there really isn't one primary that's better, but there's multiple ways to kind of do the same thing. Um, with our, in our unit, over the past four years, we followed about 200 babies. Most of them were born at less than 28 weeks and 1,000 grams um, before they come to us. And all have severe lung injury with this arrested development presentation. Um, every once in a while, we get the one child, like our first, who really just had an infection in there and we were able to clear that up, but we oftentimes find that there's a lot of um, airway injury as well. So um, it brings us to a couple questions. What is optimum respiratory support and is non-invasive ventilation always better than mechanical ventilation? Um, so we have to think about that and that's a hard decision and a hard conversation to have when we've had this very aggressive conversation for so long about getting the endotracheal tube out and getting off the ventilator. Um, really, it might be doing more harm to good in some situations. Then what medications can we use, um, and how should they be used? And some of the common ones that we see all the time are diuretics, steroids, both inhaled and systemic, and bronchodilators. And the use of inhaled um, therapies in general is, is starting to come out more. And one of the things that Brian alluded to with inhaled nitric oxide is it seems to work in this study, and it seems to not work in another. When you're providing medications, to chest x-rays and CAT scans that sounded that way, that, that looked as they did, um, that I've already presented, you need to make sure that when you're aerosolizing medication, it's actually getting to where it needs to go. And if you don't have an adequately open lung or adequately ventilated, it's not getting to the areas that it needs to go to. And that's one of the challenges with inhaled therapies in this population. Inhaled therapies in a healthy lung, you know it's getting where it's supposed to go and it's gonna treat it. But that's one of the challenges that we don't often think about. And then um, there's, there's all these other factors, microrespiration, gastric reflux, um, and then the inflammation and infection that comes with it as well. So I'm going to talk about these treatment strategies um, a little bit. Um, as we said, there's no consistent effective treatment strategy except to prevent further damage and support them as they grow. Our lungs continue to grow up until about the age of seven-ish, your airways continue to grow. So if we could just stop doing harm and, and hopefully get normal growth, then we should just be able to grow out of it, right? Um, we only use, we don't use 100% of our lungs as we breathe as adults who grew up with normal, healthy lungs, hopefully. So to have that little bit that isn't working, isn't functioning, you should be okay. Let's see if that's actually really true. So there's many different supportive measures and treatment options that we trial. Um, and one of the biggest things that we really have to think about is nutrition, and, and Brian touched on this a little bit. Um, but it plays one of the most important supportive roles in normal lung development and maturation. So if you're not getting proper nutrition, that new lung that's growing isn't growing normal and healthy. Um, and unfortunately for us, there really isn't a good way to determine appropriate nutrition for each child. Um, the calculations that we have, that we use, and the nutritionists use, are these World Health Organization calculations that are based off of normal, healthy children, which, we, which we're not treating. And then, they add these series of stress factors for this and for that that aren't well validated. And we're not really sure that that stress factor works for that child. We saw the different types of lung disease in four different cases. So do we really think that one stress factor for adding nutrition is gonna help each one of these? One's an infection, one's just airway disease. So it's to think of our nutrition as a cookie cutter method when we can't think of a ventilation or anything else as a cookie cutter method for these children either. So oftentimes we end up, as Brian had said, overfeeding and contributing to our difficulty to wean. When you have all of this mass on your chest, it's really hard to wean them down. And you need that additional ventilation and additional levels of PEEP. Um, so we need to find better ways to collect individualized measurements for calculations. As Brian has said, at, at Boston Children's, they're doing a really good job at spearheading a lot of this research, um, doing um, indirect colorimetry measurements 
and something we're starting to do a little bit more of at, at CHOP. Um, but this is something that's more of the future direction to kind of really find out what our nutritional needs are. So this is just one example of disproportionate growth, and I'm sure we all have this type of child in our unit. Um, this is one of our actual babies, kind of a shorter squatter person, and this is a growth curve. So we tend to, every week, we, we sit down our entire chronic multidisciplinary chronic lung disease team and we look at all aspects of care to make sure that if we're doing our job right and we're doing the right thing for this baby, that everything should be moving in a positive direction. If one thing is not moving in a positive direction, then we need to take pause and have that conversation. So here's this baby's growth curve over time. And it's interesting, oops, I went backwards, sorry for that. Um, this, that child was a 27-weeker, um, born at 760 grams, was on a ventilator for eight weeks, multiple failed extubations. And you can see over time, this is when we extubated and our growth flattened off. We were reintubated and the growth took off. If you're using all of the energy that you have to breathe, how can you grow? And oftentimes, you can't tolerate anything else going on. You can't tolerate anybody touching you, you can't tolerate the lights coming on, you can't tolerate um, you know, the, the things that the children are supposed to be able to do is to grow, and if you can't grow, how can you do anything else? Um, how can you develop neuro de neurally and, and start doing anything else to be able to learn and play as we need to do going forward? Sorry, I keep going backwards. Um, so other treatment strategies is looking at adequate, accurate respiratory support, and enough support to not make this child work too hard. Um, so that, as well as, you, you need to support everything else so much. So we really need to make sure that we're getting enough. Sometimes looking at our nutrition, we have to add a little more protein, a little less calories. We try to get occupational and physical therapy involved and see how much they're tolerating. Usually we have to increase their respiratory support. And accurate peak levels, we found, was key. If they're not growing, and they're unable to tolerate handling, and they're getting the synchronous with the ventilator and discomfort, the first thing that we do is increase our peeps and look at our waveforms and look at how the baby handles. So depending on what device they are on, making sure if they're on non-invasive or high flow, do we need to increase support and then reevaluate them and see how they're doing. As I said, chest CTs on almost everyone, the cyanic CTs really helps us look at the lung tissue and see what type of a problem is. So is there actually recruitable lung there? Because haziness on a chest x-ray just looks like haziness on the chest x-ray, but you don't really know, is that recruitable lung? Is it fibrotic? Is it some sort of parenchymal disease? So you know which direction to go in. So for us, being able to get these dynamic CTs has helped us individualize ventilation a little bit to know where we have to go for these babies. And now looking at the aerosolized medications. Um, bronchodilators um, is something that we found is generally not really helpful. There were two-point prevalence studies that were done within the United States looking at what types of therapies were given to individuals, uh, infants with severe BPD. And 33 to 67% of infants during both of those point prevalence studies were on some sort of bronchodilator. Um, I'm not sure what the approvals are here for you all, but in the United States, they're not even approved for use under the age of two, but we do it all the time. But there's no studies saying that they actually do anything. And this arrested development of their airway disease and the prematurity, do they even have airway muscle that's going to react? We don't know. So, but we're still giving them bronchodilators. Are they really harmful? Eh, who knows? I mean, the side effects from, from albuterol or, or some sort of a beta-2 agonist doesn't really, isn't that cause that many problems. A very small amount get them, their heart rate goes up for a little bit, maybe their blood pressure goes up, but as long as it comes back down, who cares? The problem comes in is that if you have floppy airways and you take away whatever security of muscle they have and then make it floppier, you make the airways floppier. So if you're not assessing 10 to 15 minutes after the, this bronchodilator was given to see if they've gotten worse with their dynamic hyperinflation or anything else going on the ventilator, you don't really know that it's not causing worse problems. Just because what we always look for as a side effect for bronchodilators is in their cardiac response, not in their ventilation response in these infants. And that's where we tend to see it the most. So, um, the other thing is, oftentimes people add bronchodilators on because they hear wheezing in the airways. And this is our, our whole standpoint for this conference, is going back to the basics. And the basics of wheezing is, all wheezing is, is turbulent airflow. It doesn't mean there's actually bronchoconstriction. Turbulent airflow can be caused by anything. It can be caused by secretions in the airway, it can be caused by a stenotic airway. All it is is I'm breathing really fast, 
through a tube that's smaller than it should be. It could be for many reasons. It doesn't always mean that it's bronchoconstriction that's causing that wheezing. So we have to look at their response to therapy over a period of time. If it's bronchoconstriction, they're going to get better and not worse after the bronchodilator is given. So um, this is one area where trials can be done to really figure out if there's a response to therapy. And because we have such difficult, challenging lung disease to begin with, we really can't use the same methods that we always use for that assessment. So this is um, one study trial that we're currently um, working on at IRB Walker Lettuce because um, we're going through that process um, to really take a look at some lung mechanics on ventilators and the lung mechanics that everybody has to take a look at, not just research centers, um, to see in a real life scenario, do we know bronchodilators are actually working? And then what's the best dose? Because between aerosolized me medicine literature and, and our pharmacists and pharmaceutical literature, they disagree widely. Um, moving on to corticosteroids from an inhalation method, the theory is that it should assist with some airway inflammation. We just don't know the dose. It's not approved for this age population nor this disease process. Um, there are no good clinical trials at all that have been done to show any long-term outcomes. Um, we do know in asthma that if we use inhaled bronchodilators at higher doses for a period of time, it does stunt growth um, and, and injury with bone. So we need to worry about those things and make sure that we're not doing something that's more harmful over the long run. Um, but, but that is something for the future. Mucolytics, something to help with the, with the airway plugging. Um, this could be helpful when suspected. Um, trials definitely need to be performed using Dornase um, or and hypertonic saline, either three or five percent. Um, if there's no benefit that's seen without 48 hours to really discontinue it. There was one trial um, that was done, a crossover trial in infants um, on mechanical ventilation with uh, uh, RDS that looked at the use of hypertonic saline, the use, and they used 3% in the, in the study, um, the use of Dornase Alpha, and then the combined together. And there's actually a greater effect of the, using them combined for 48 uh, to 36 hours. They have resolution of the airway plugging, and they were able to make some moves on ventilation. But it's not really a long-term treatment strategy. It's short-term to get rid of um, the barrier. Systemic steroids, this is something that um, has been proven effective. In each individual patient, we give them systemic steroids, we're able to wean down on their ventilator, we're able to, to decrease their oxygenation, but at what cost? And that's part of the problem. Um, it should definitely be used with caution and only for short bursts um, when it's needed to assist to, to give you that extra bump to get off the ventilator um, or for an extubation trial. But there are many, many side effects that we need to worry about and we really need to weigh the pros and the cons of our use versus our short-term benefit and our long-term harm. This was a trial um, or a Cochrane uh, review that was done, uh, just updated in 2010, looking at the use of dexamethasone in the first seven days of life only. There's a lot of trials of use of dexamethasone in the first seven days. There aren't a lot of trials of use of BPD patients longer term and what the outcomes are on the neurodevelopment that way or their bone health. Um, so a lot of the trials that we're using are coming from this premature um, group at a very different stage that they are than when they're four or five months old with lung injury and we're trying to get them off the ventilator. So a lot isn't known. But we still have problems and we still need to, to look at all these cons very seriously. Intestinal perforation, CP, poor growth, hypertension, hyperglycemia, and adrenal suppression. We see some of this on these patients, some of the shorter ones already. Um, but we really need to be concerned with their long-term neural development as well. Diuretic therapy, um, we've used this on individual patients as well, and it has helped some. Um, it can be associated with um, improved lung function. You can get the fluid out of there, you can start to ventilate better, reduces lung edema, and improves the pulmonary compliance, but their long-term use is very unclear, and we're not sure what the side effects are. It's generally reserved for those that are in higher amounts of oxygen um, and have some associated cardiac failure, where you would have been using that um, anyway, but it definitely we see, see the changes in electrolyte imbalances that you then need to monitor closely and make sure that you're keeping on top of so you don't cause more problems. Um, gastroesophageal reflux. This is a big issue that we found with some of our infants. So this was a study um, that was in 2004's Journal of Perinatology 
that looked at 629 infants born less than 32 weeks gestational age and um, showed that there's a lack of relationship. You either have it or you don't, and it doesn't really matter whether you have BPD or not, but it's still a problem in infants, and we see that. An additional trial that was done at CHOP that was just published in 2014, Pediatric Pulmonary, and we did a retrospective review at 22 infants that have severe BPD. Um, a majority of those end up getting um, surgery, and this in front of application, um, to help, and we looked at the one day post-op and 14 days post-op, and did see, did not see a, a significant change in non-invasive positive pressure or ventilation, of both non-invasive or inhaled mechanical ventilation, um, but we did see a reduction in FiO2, which was significant. And with all the harm that we know FiO2 does, that should be something that's, that we look at as, as beneficial. And we saw a reduction in the median respiratory rate. It didn't change how we treated them, non-invasively overall, but we saw that their work of breathing went down. So we do see that, that gastric reflux is a problem. We're currently just about towards the end of an N1 trial, um, a series um, on infants where we're doing um, blinded pulse oximetry monitoring with their feeds, gastric feeds, and then the wagnall feeds for a period of time, taking a look at the results and see if there's an, if there's an increase in um, desaturations and bradycardia events giving a recommendation um, to the families. And we have found that some infants were a good portion of our chronic lung disease team physicians were like, this kid needs a needs an ISN and a G2, this kid needs an ISN and a G2. Where our end of one trial and really looking at the effects of gastric reflux didn't show it. The child didn't do any different in gastric feeds than they did duodenal feeds. So it, um, in those infants, it was having that additional information helped us to then help counsel and have discussion with the family they were still on very high levels of ventilatory support, but we didn't feel that gastric reflux, reflux was a primary component, that if we just did this in the G2, could we avoid a trach? And we have had several infants where we did recommend this in the G2, did that, and we were able to avoid a tracheostomy, and they just went home on oxygen support. So really taking a look at those differences, um, and those infants were helpful, but we'll see how this trial ends to see if simply doing a trial of, of gastric versus volatile feeds can really give you um, that definitive answer. So screening, um, really who should, be, who should be screened for pulmonary hypertension? This is a huge comorbidity um, in this population. Um, and what's really the diagnostic criteria? Can you just look at your, at your EKGs, your echoes? Do you need a CT angiogram? Do you need to go to cardiac catheterizations? All of our cardiologists will try to do an echo, but it's only a moment in time. And we found with these severe BPD kids that it changes according to their ventilation status, definitely, um, and if there's anything else going on. So the moment in time that we got the child nice and quiet for the echo, they didn't see it. But most of the time, we're seeing those effects of those swings that is if they have pulmonary hypertension. So they tell us that really cardiac catheterization is the gold standard, but it's just not practical uh, to bring all of your infants that you suspect it to, to get a cardiac catheterization. So it's something that we still trouble, struggle with. We do trials of nitric oxide because it's quick and we can try. However, it's definitely not cheap. It's very expensive. So there's still conversations um, about that. So um, there's oops, um, other therapies and treatments. If you have or suspect pulmonary hypertension, um, I'm sure that Brian is going to touch on these going forward um, with his next talk. Uh, but inhaled nitric oxides, Denafil, Bosentan, prostacyclins, milrinone, there's a lot of different things out there if you don't have nitric available to go to. There's a couple studies, nothing is very um, definitive. Um, and really, should, should all infants be put on pulmonary hypertensive medications? There's a lot of side effects with these things. There are some um, developing countries that will give trials of Sedenafil, because they can do that more quickly to see if there's any response um, and then we their therapy that way. We use nitric oxide for that in the United States because um, it's quicker and we don't need to get pharmacy to approve it. But it's definitely a lot more expensive. Um, looking at the incidence of pulmonary hypertension with BPD, um, this uh, trial that was published in 2010 showed 25% of the infants less than 32 weeks of age had BPD, and, and the more severity of BPD, BPD, you had a higher incidence of pulmonary hypertension. Over 50% of infants with severe BPD had pulmonary hypertension versus only under 10% with moderate and none with mild. So your more severe BPD, you're gonna be a little bit more suspect of having it. 
Um, using BNP as an option as a screening factor, we started doing this, although this is not a validated marker at all, um, and it really needs to be, but we have found, and this is just one snapshot of an infant who, when we trend their, their BNPs over time, at this, at this time frame here, we had an increase in the tidal volume of PEEP, and we paralyzed the baby because they were having problems. This is when paralysis came off, we had a bump back up, and we found a really nice low level here. So we started weaning the ventilator, and our BNP weights went right back up, and at this point, we increased the tidal volume. So it's really helping us try to find what, what's the best thing, and when we know that we're doing a better job of trying to manage their pulmonary hypertension, We've also found that from a ventilation standpoint in our severe BPD kids, that a tidal volume of 10 per kilo, once they hit the diagnosis of severe BPD, we do a lot better and are able to come down on other support, keeping their tidal volume up higher than we would normally would. Um, so our new management concepts um, really are in our older infants with established lung disease, giving them adequate respiratory support is really the most important. Um, and BPD will not get better, it can only really get worse, and you need to be able to grow new healthy lungs, new healthy airways, um, and the, where the injury in the lungs are gonna persist, and we really need to, to help and support these infants adequately over that time frame. Lung disease and BPD is not all the same. Treatment definitely needs to be individualized to our underlying pathology is best that we're able to really figure that out. And this really is a multi-system problem, and only treating the lungs isn't enough. We see this big uh, proportion of poor growth, or disproportionate growth, um, with height first weight, gastric reflux, and feeding difficulties, and microrespiration that's occurring, our bone health, um, visual and hearing health as well, because we need to be looking into our neurodevelopmental outcomes. We're not just trying to, to stop mortality. We also need to try to stop morbidity, and we need to try to make their quality of life as best as possible. We start having our children get vision screens, which, Nobody was happy for us when we brought somebody down to a visual screen on an intubated baby. But they couldn't focus on us, and we wanted to know what the problem was. Is there something going on in here? Vision screen is easier to get done than an MRI on a child, and, and a lot safer. This kid ended up needing glasses, and then he was very interactive with everyone. It was amazing. Um, but the developmental delays and our long-term neurodevelopmental problems really need to be thought of. Um, with the steroids and everything else that we do, we're really causing problems on these babies, and we're really seeing a lot of osteopenia, and fractures occurring on our routine x-rays. Um, and then really know that just because they leave the NICU doesn't mean these problems stop. As Brian had mentioned, they then leave the NICU and get readmitted re re into the PICU and we continue to have longer problems. And unfortunately, it's something that they have to deal with through life. This trial that was published in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine shows this. Your blue bars up at the top is your FEV1 for normal children, and this is the number that they have for the control. And then these are survivors of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. They never get lung catch-up growth. Their FEV1 never gets back to normal according to this study. It's only one study, but it's a very powerful one to know when you're helping to advise long-term. There was a newer trial that just came out really showing that COPD symptoms comes much sooner in this population if they have a CPD. So it's lung, um, lung growth is something and lung disease that they, they continue on with for their entire lives. And the neurodevelopmental risks. This study in, in 2013 um, by Barbara Schmidt and JAMA shows that the more comorbidities you have, the worse off you are in your outcomes at 18 months of age. And it really showed some, some direct correlations. If, if you have, um, for prematurity, um, in, in general, this was actually a a um, sub-analysis that was brought out of the endomethacin prophylaxis in preterm infants trial. So if anyone is familiar with that TIP trial, this was a sub-analysis that they did out of that, and they showed the comorbidities that you have and, and your poor, your predictability of poor outcomes at, at 18 months of age. Just being premature alone with none of these factors gets you at about 20% um, having a poor outcome at 18 months of age. Each comorbidity that you add on increases your risk of having a poor outcome. So if we can stop at having bad lung disease and prevent IVH and ROP, we're doing a great service for quality of life for these infants. So it's not enough to just think of stopping BP and stopping prevention. If we do cause injury to the lung, but we can stop ROP or bleeds from occurring, then that's huge. Um, again, 
This, this was a trial at 18 months of age, the NICHD trial, that looked at the odds of having CP um, in BPD infants was 1.66. And again, in that TIP trial, they saw that BPD was independently correlated to poor outcomes um, in infants, including death or CP. They put morbidity on the same level with mortality in this analysis, which, which some parents of premature infants taking care of them through life might say is just as important. Their cognitive delay, their hearing loss, and their blindness. And then when they hit school year of age, they had worse cognitive performance, impaired psycho psychoeducational performance, and difficulties with their gross and fine motor skills. They had lower IQs. And 50% of very low birth weight infants with BPD also continued to receive OT and PT out to eight months of age. So this is something that we need to remember goes well beyond the NICU doors. Their hearing problems and their visual problems, assessing those early on in the NICU, which we haven't always done, um, is quite important. And there was, um, there has been information out stating that um, our, I think this in, in the next slide, yeah, cognitive monitoring and pulmonary functions by pediatric pulmonary, our long-term monitoring and management by pulmonary hypertension groups, we end up continuing to do home care, ENT, and our psychomotor support in their hearing, um, being done at one year of age and not sooner, we know that it's not very predictive as to whether or not they're gonna have hearing problems if we do it before one year of age. Um, so we're also doing, our entire group with BPD looks much beyond the lungs. And it's definitely made me branch out a lot where, from where I was before, concentrating mostly on the lungs. But as I said, we sit down and we talk an entire group once a week on every single baby. It takes quite a while. And we go through with OT and PT, speech, nutrition, and phone health. Everyone is there. So we have one core group of neonatologists that kind of manage most of it. We've added a couple doctors that are getting a little overworked. Um, but all of these individual people contribute to the care. It's really hard to adequately assess and care for all of the comorbidities and all of the long-term problems with these infants without actually having a good group to really look at all of the extra pieces um, and looking at their outcomes. And one of the things that we have made a commitment to with the other uh, BPD collaborative groups is looking at evidence-based research, um, at all of our evidence-based research, looking at the treatment and prevention of BPD, also looking at long-term outcomes going out. So we can adequately say, there might be one intervention that doesn't improve morbidity or doesn't improve mortality, but it might improve morbidity. So if we always only look at mortality or BPD as our endpoint, we're never really seeing all the benefits that we can provide to these babies. Um, and this is the collaborating group that works together. There's nine, now nine members. They meet often um, to, to kind of troubleshoot and work on studies together so we can get those large randomized trials that we all want to know if any of these treatments are working. Any questions from anyone? Yeah. What precaution could shade those gastroesophageal reflux to prevent him from bronchopulmonary dysplasia to occur regarding the residual treatment? Um, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. What precaution is the precaution to shade those gastroesophageal reflux to prevent him from occurring the bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Okay. Um, so, so, what preventions for gastric reflux? Unfortunately, there isn't much to prevent gastric reflux in the beginning, but we can slow down its harmfulness. So for us, um, and hopefully we'll know soon if this is a great marker after this N1 trial is done, um, we do a trial of gastric feeds and then monitor their respiratory status. We do a trial of um, post pyloric feeds. And if they do better with apneas and bradycardias and desaturations on post pyloric feeds, then we push for innocent fungal ligation, surgery, and a G2. So we go through the anti-reflux surgeries. And with some infants, a good portion of them, we've been successful in avoiding the tracheostomy. It doesn't do anything to the harm that was already done to the trachea and the lungs, but it helps prevent further damage. But it's, it's a hard surgery to sell to parents, unfortunately, um, because it's very invasive, and nobody wants their little one who's already that sick to go through surgery again. Reflux is one of those things that you can't see, <laughs> you know?